part one of developmental psychology. We're going to go all the way from conception, and we're going to look all the way through PHA stages of cognitive development. It's a long one, so let's get started. First of all, developmental psychology wants to look at three things. Number one, it wants to see uh, talk about nature nurture, which as we've mentioned before, <clears throat> nature we're talking about our genes or genetics, and nurture is the environment. So we're looking, uh, we're wondering as as the people develop, is it the genes that it causes are causing the child or the adult to do the things that they're doing, or is it the environment? And usually we find it's a combination of both. Continuity and stages is a second area that developmental psychologists look at. Uh, this looks at the fact of whether or not your your physical, motor, emotional, cognitive development goes like, is, is it gradual, is it continuous, is it like an escalator moving gradually up, or is it more of a stage like a stair step or like going up the rungs of a ladder, like you go here, then you make it here, then you make it here, which is it, is it more gradual or is it here? Are, and again, does it have to be one way for everything in life or is it some things stages and some things more continuous? And then finally, stability versus change. Do those things that you uh, have um, related to you, do they stay the same throughout your entire life or are they able to change? If they're able to change, why are they able to change? How are they changing? Et cetera. So these are the three things that we look at in developmental psychology. All right, so birth. First thing is you have an egg. It gets... Uh, it meets a sperm and a zygote is created. That's a fertilized egg. A zygote is a fertilized, fertilized egg. And you were a zygote for about two weeks. All right, you're a zygote for about two weeks and then you move on. Rapid cell division goes on in here. That's one cell, you know, the egg's a cell, right? And one cell divides rapidly, big time for those two weeks and then by two weeks, it's called an embryo. This is a picture of an embryo right here. Okay, embryo is from about two weeks to two months, roughly. Okay, um, two weeks to two months. And then at two months, it turns into a fetus, or it doesn't turn into this magically. We just start calling it a fetus. And a fetus is uh, from two months to, to birth. So that's all the way to birth. It's a fetus, right? This is a picture of a fetus at about nine weeks. All right, that's kind of crazy, right? Nine weeks, I'm sorry, not nine weeks. That's a little over four months. At a little over four months, you can see a perfect hand, you can see it ears, you can see eyes. I mean, look at that, it's a little tiny human being. So four months, right, you're about three ounces and you can fit inside the palm of a, of a hand, so four months. There's actually been babies who have been born a little after four months and they've actually survived. Um, so technology's come a long way. Another term that we need to be familiar with is teratogens. And this is stuff that gets into the blood while the baby's developing. So alcohol, drugs, uh, secondhand smoke, uh, regular smoke, uh, anything like that, Ex excess stress. Um, hormones and whatnot can affect the baby's development. So teratogen is something that you really don't want to have. It can harm the baby's development. You get stuff like fetal alcohol syndrome um, and stuff like that that you don't want to have. So we want to stay away from those. All right, so how do we learn about newborns? Like developmental psychology up until like the 60s, um, people just thought that babies were kind of just saw the world through this kind of uh, haze and they just saw colors and shapes and they really didn't know much until they got older. Uh, it's actually one of the ideas that William James, a name you've heard before, uh, kind of promoted and nobody really questioned it because there was no way to test it. But then around the 60s, people kind of got a little bit more wise on the subject and said, you know what, we can test this thing. We just got to figure out what questions to ask and how to test it. And they learned in the 60s and on to tell today that babies have this thing called habituation, which means they look at, and same thing as we do as adults, we look at novel stimulus. So when we see something that's new, we look at it. And if we see it over and over again, we start to become less interested. And so habituation, what a baby will do is it'll look at a new, something that it, that it thinks is novel or that it's grown accustomed to, and it won't, um, 
and it'll look less at something else. So what do babies good at? They're good at looking, right? They're good at turning their heads. What else are they good at? Sucking. Um, yeah, those things. And so when a baby does one of those things, we know that it's responding. So we, we test things and we put sensors on like pacifiers. We see if they're turning their head. We, we time how long they look at things. And by testing these, you know, we're answering questions about what's going on in that baby's brain. Which is kind of cool, right? And this is uh, Eli. He's obviously fascinated by me over here. Um, I think I don't remember who took that picture, but probably me. Good look at that smile, right? So uh, moving on, physical development. Here's a picture of their brain development of a baby at birth. You've got about 23 billion, 23 billion neurons, right? We just talked about neurons in the last unit. 23 billion neurons. Uh, but those neurons don't have a whole lot of connections, right? Those, remember we talked about uh, every time you know you learn something new, you're making that neural connection. At about three months, it's looking a lot better, and then look at this: 15 months, and that thing's going crazy up there in your brain, right? Today, you know, this is like a big pink thing in your in your brain right now, All right? So the brain develops very quickly, and it's uh, taking in all this information at a super super fast rate and just absorbing it all and using it. Motor development uh, with babies tend to all go in a pretty specific order. Almost across the board, universally, babies tend to do the same things around the same times. For instance, let's talk about walking. Um, at about 11 months, you got about 25% of babies can walk. You know, within a week after 12 months, within one week, you got 50%. So a week after their first birthday, over half babies can walk. And then by 15 months, 90 plus percent of babies can walk and so you get a pretty small little air time frame there and within that time babies are going to walk and then they're going to move on to the next thing and so motor development tends to go in stages and it's pretty concrete across the board um, babies tend to actually mature and have their have a memory now they can't something happens before uh anything before three years we have what's called um, infantile amnesia Amnesia. I don't know how to spell infantile. Infantile. Maybe I might. I'm probably wrong on the spelling there. Uh, infantile amnesia, and that's you really can't remember anything earlier than three years. And if you do, it's probably not true. Uh, you're probably missing some key points there. And so babies, uh, you don't tend to remember anything. However, your brain is still learning. It's still maturing, and it's still learning and remembering things, whether you know it or not. For instance. Uh, there was a study done where students were at, maybe they were in early, early elementary school and they were asked to pick out kids from their preschool class. Now, they could, they could recognize maybe one in five of those kids. They could recognize them. But um, their brain, um, judged by the judging um, skin temperature and different other methods, showed a marked increase for the kids that they did have in their class. So their brain, well, didn't remember it or wasn't able to retrieve it. It did know, it could recognize without them really even knowing it, that those kids had been in their class before. And so uh, all these different things are happening at a crazy fast rate when you're, when you're young. Um, now kids, as they're learning, they develop these things called schemas. A schema is just a way to look at the world. All right. Uh, I like to think of it as like the tools that you have uh, to look through the world. For instance, if I had a certain set of tools and I was asked to build a house, right, I would try to find a way to build a house using those tools that I have, right? That's the way I'm going to look at how I'm going to build that house. If I had more advanced tools, I'd look at building that house a little different way, maybe a little bit easier. But whatever tools I have, that's how I'm going to have to try to build that house. That's my schema. That's the method I have of looking, the lens I'm looking through my situation with. And kids have this schema. What they know is their schema, right? They take they take the information that they know and they try to make sense of the world around them using that information. Now when they take when they have that schema and they find something new, they try to assimilate it into their current schema. Assimilate means take something um, else and try to fit it into what you already know. So for instance, if a child learns that 
a uh, four-legged animal is a dog, right? So they see a four-legged animal, right? There's my dog, look at that dog. It's got the little ears there. It's more of a cat, I think, I don't know. So it's got the dog there and, oh, that's even, oh, that's awesome, that's amazing. And uh, they say, okay, well, that's a dog. And then they actually see uh, another four-legged animal, but this time it's a cow, right? That's a nice cow, look at that. Maybe actually, maybe I'm actually doing a better cow. It's actually a pretty good cow. I'm impressed. Uh, they see a cow and they call this thing a dog, right? Because their schema says animals, four legs, dog. All right. So they call this a cow. Then your mom or your dad or whatever said, no, 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 honey, that's a cow. So now they have to accommodate. Accommodate is when you take new information that you've learned about, right? That this big thing here is a cow. And then you rearrange your old information. You rearrange what you already know to make to fit this new information in. So now, I, instead of saying that all animals that have four legs are dogs, I say, well, there's, this, there's exceptions to this rule now. There's cows, so there must be other exceptions to this rule as well. And so you change your schema, right? Accommodation is a change in your schema. Assimilate, you take information and you incorporate it into your schema. Accommodation, you change your schema to fit the new stuff that you found. All right. Um, you let's think of accommodation like if you have to accommodate somebody's request for dinner, right? You have somebody who's a vegan and you're having a dinner party. You have to accommodate them. You have to change yourself. You have to change your menu. You have to change whatever you're doing to make to fit them. That's what accommodate. Accommodate means you, you're changing. Assimilate. If you say, well, you just need to assimilate into this environment. So if you're vegan and you're going to a country that doesn't have vegan, you're gonna to have to assimilate, which means you have to change yourself to fit that. So you, assimilate means take whatever you have there and fit with, with what's already going on. All right, and then uh, a last thing we vocabulary word here is uh, theory of mind. Theory of mind is being able to see somebody else do something and think how they would be thinking or try to understand how they would be thinking rather than assuming that they're thinking the exact same thing that you are. So for instance, a common example is um, this girl or this person sees this bear being put into this box, right? It's put into this box. Now the person leaves the room, right? Somebody comes in, takes the bear out, and when this person comes back in, they ask the child, what's this person going to think? Where are they going to look for the bear, right? And the child's probably going to say wherever they see the bear. So if the bear is over here in another box or something, or it's up here, they're going to say, look, it's up here, it's up here. He's going to look right there. And they're thinking, they're saying they're going to look there because that's where they would look because they just saw the whole situation go down. Somebody that has, some, has theory of mind is going to say, wait a second, this person didn't see the same things that I saw, and so he's still going to look right here. All right, finally, Piaget's stages of cognitive development. We'll go through very quickly. Uh, stage one is sensory motor. This goes to about two years. This is from birth to about two years. Um, and this is where you take in the environment basically just with your senses. Taste, touch, feel, um, hearing. You're, you're taking in the world around you with your senses. That's what you're doing most of it, and you're making processing it through that. Pre-operational is you use a lot of intuition intuition and you're trying to make sense of the world through that you don't you don't reason very well you don't think logically very well and pre-operational goes from about two to six or seven somewhere in there right use a lot of intuition right this is where you can see a lot of cool things with kids right they don't they don't have this idea of conservation um so if you took a short glass of water and a really tall glass of uh, empty glass he took the short glass uh, two or he took two short glasses of water and then he poured one of those short glasses into a really tall glass right then they these two short ones had exactly the same amount of water in it the kids always gonna say that the tall glass has more water in it because they don't understand that well they have the same here so things are gonna be conserved and go into the other one concrete operational you think a little bit more logically you basically think the same way as you did in pre-operational, but you understand more things. You understand how things work a little bit better, and so you have a little bit more logic that goes into it. And then formal operational is from about, oh, concrete goes to about 12 years, from 6 to 7 to about 12, and then 
uh, formal operational is 12 years on. All right, from 12 years on, you're thinking formally. This is where you can think abstractly. Abstract. And uh, this is where you're at right now. So nice work. Good job. Hopefully we got this in under 15.